Since our country was founded, America has been a beacon of hope to the world, a free, prosperous country populated by some of the greatest people in human history. Unlike the slum-ridden cities of the third world, America has mostly been middle class, the land of opportunity. But now, due to a combination of terrible forces, that way of life is under threat. One of those threats is our open border. Since Joe Biden took office, more than 8 million people have entered our country illegally. That is nearly the population of New Jersey. Now, these people have to go somewhere. And you can bet that they're not going to Malibu or Nantucket. No, they are coming to you. And it doesn't take a genius to point out that if you import the third world with no restrictions, no rules, no plan, you end up becoming more third world yourself. Last fall, a development named Colony Ridge became a media sensation when news organizations reported that it was a booming haven of illegal immigrants and potentially a strategic asset for cartels. The community, which also goes by the Spanish name Toronto's Houston, is the fastest growing development in Texas. It's just a 30 minute drive from Houston, America's fourth largest city. And yet it seemed like the state of Texas, the biggest and most important red state in the country, didn't really seem to care. How could that be? Well, we decided to check it out for ourselves. So we went to Colony Ridge and we spoke to all the key players, outraged Texans, former and current Colony Ridge residents, local law enforcement, the superintendent of schools, and the developer himself, John Harris. What we found is a complicated story, which we decided to share with you in detail and with total openness and fairness. This is Blaze Originals. We're at the headquarters of Ternos Houston or Ternos Santa Fe. Not sure, but we'll ask him when we, uh, when we get inside. We're gonna talk to the man with the answers. He's the CEO of the colonies. Hey, How are you? Good to see you. I'm like Sears and Roba. I have a product, I created it, I sell it. Developer John Harris started Colony Ridge with his brother Trey and his cousin Kevin in 2011. Located in the rural area that was once mostly hunting leases and timberland, Colony Ridge exploded in popularity thanks to owner finance loans. For $500 down and 12.9% interest, buyers can purchase their own slice of rural Texas regardless of their credit worthiness or citizenship. How many people live in Colony Ridge currently? Approximately 35,000. 35,000. The development is controversial because unlike mortgages offered by traditional banks, Colony Ridge can issue loans with no credit requirements and limited ID verification to foreign borrowers. The federal government gives illegal immigrants individual taxpayer identification numbers, which makes them eligible for the loans Colony Ridge offers. Though Harris insists most of his customers are American. So you're, are, is it majority American citizens? Sure, absolutely. Really? <clears throat> Do you have any idea what the... Percentage is? Yeah. No, because we don't ask and we really can't as a So as then a, how do you know that seller, it's the majority? Well, Texas driver's license, social security number, I'm guessing, right? Because not because a lot of foreign born folks can have those things. Okay, all right. Um, do you, col you don't collect citizenship information though? We don't. Okay, so when you were talking about, because um, I've heard you talk about this is you know, great for American dream, right? Absolutely, sure. What's the American dream to you? To me? Yeah. Own, own something of your own, own your own home, build a, build a life for your family, have a safe place for your kids to go to school. That's what we're trying to create for people here. Is that a safe place to go to school? Absolutely. 
you view this as a service for America, that this is good yes. for America? No, I'm, I'm very proud of what we do here. We, we look, I, if I wasn't doing this to help people, I would have been retired a long time ago. I'm providing a service. I'm providing land. My customers are better Americans than most of the people who listen to your show. They, they work hard. They're family oriented. They're, they're just out here to improve their lives. They came from Harris County. That's the only border they're worried about. To be honest, we were surprised at Harris's claims. For months, media reports boldly claimed Colony Ridge was a haven for crime, cartels, and illegal immigrants. Were they wrong? Was I wrong? Or was someone lying? And if so, who? We were just trying to provide something for the customer at the bottom of the market, right? The lower end people that didn't have an opportunity for anything else. And <clears throat> it, we did really good. It, 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 turned, it lit up really fast. The boom is fueled by Colony Ridge's marketing strategy. They aggressively advertise online and almost entirely in Spanish. And we, we learned really quickly that the market that was the best for that product was were Hispanic immigrants. I mean, it just seemed like they pay their bills better. Uh, it, they, it kept, it, it worked better. When you talk to them, if you're honest and you talk to a, a broad spectrum, the vast majority are gonna be extremely happy. I was really torn because he seemed like that Saturday Night Live, you know, 60 Minutes character that, you know, drinking water and sweating profusely. But I had the facts only from what I had read in the New York Post and I didn't know. Yeah, I, he seemed to have an answer for almost everything. Right. So immediately this is, I mean, I think the feel was this is a lot more complicated yes. than what we thought. The only way we're gonna be able to figure this out is to actually go out there, get on the ground, talk to people, figure it out for ourselves. This day I had a radio program I had to put on so I wasn't free to spend another day in what the critics call the world's largest trailer park. So I sent my head writer and chief researcher, Jason Buttrill, back into Colony Ridge to talk to the people who live there. When you drive through here, it pretty much looks like you're in Mexico. You see homes with businesses attached directly to them and almost like it was a free for all. The first thing you notice about Colony Ridge is that it's nothing like the surrounding area. And we got tamales out of some guy's trailer. Not sure if it's open right now, but that's kind of par for the course at her. Even among the massive developments that are so common in Texas, Colony Ridge stood out. Check out these roads. There's not any lines on these roads. I mean, I don't even, you can't even tell which side of the street you're really supposed to even drive on, much less crosswalks or anything like that. And this is the middle of the development. Nothing was in English. Packs of stray dogs roamed the streets, farm animals were living in people's yards, trash, dead animals, including dead dogs, were lying on sides of the roads. And there was plenty of housing, but very few businesses. It felt strange. It didn't just feel like a different country. It felt like a different world. Very little regulation, you know, can turn the American world into the third world. After Colony Ridge became a media sensation, the Texas legislator sent $40 million for increased patrols in the development. We're here with Blaze TV, Glenn, Glenn Beck's Blaze TV, and we're doing a documentary on the Colony Ridge area. Can you guys talk at all? Not at all. In broad daylight and with the heavy police presence, Colony Ridge didn't seem the cartel-dominated killing fields while we were there, though the troopers weren't interested in talking to us. Luckily, the locals were more open to it. So we just found uh, a little side vendor selling clothes. As far as uh, like we've heard about some gang activity, uh, specifically like cartel activity, any ref any rumors of that out here at all? Uh, you don't get me down nada. Yeah, Todo se mira tranquilo. Everything is so calm here. Uh, would you would you tell me even if uh, even if there if it was real? <laughs> no, no hay por qué. No, 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 no. Um, where where, where are you from originally? De donde, de donde es Mexico. In Mexico. Like many of the people we encountered, he was friendly. He even invited us into his home. Or well, when did you come to Texas? I guess from Mexico. When did you go? In the 18, 2018. 2018. Is he worried about all the people coming over the border? Pues la verdad yo pienso que todo el mundo tiene derecho a a a querer un algo mejor. 
Person after person was willing to talk to us, including this woman running a taqueria in her yard. Um, do you live here in Colony Ridge? Sí. When did you come here? Hace seis años. And you came from where? Houston. And before, Houston. Uh, before that? Mexico. Did you become a citizen when you came over here or still haven't done that yet? No. Is this the American dream that you expected? Pues es un poco mejor que estar en, en mi país. We heard reports of like people firing gunshots sometimes at night. Ever hear that? Yeah, todo lo, todos los días. Every day. Every day, gunshots. We've noticed a lot of livestock, like what you have kind of in the back over here. Is that is that pretty normal for Colony Ridge? Sí. It's interesting, just got finished talking to um, the woman that owns this taco stand. Uh, this is her lot, she also lives adjacent. And uh, kind of confirms slightly what we've heard from the developer. Um, she also came from Houston, which that's a check mark on that. But she came from Mexico beforehand, and she's also not a citizen. We were just driving down, and I kind of felt like we found a little corner of Cancun <laughs> uh, right here in the middle of Colony Ridge. Where's you from? Uh, Mexico. When did y'all move to Colony Ridge? Uh, in 2020. From where? Uh, Houston. When did uh, your family immigrate from Mexico over to here? Mm, oh my god, that was like... 25 years ago. 25 years <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, it's been like a really long time. Are you first generation U.S. citizen or? Yeah, well, like, uh, not really, but like I'm being here for a really long time. They brought me here when I was like really little, six months old. So. so as the sun's going down here in Colony Ridge, we're driving out and we see the smoke plumes rising. And uh, those smoke plumes are from people burning their trash. I served in Afghanistan. Um, every third world or even a war-torn country always smells that way. The people here, um, Definitely majority are illegal immigrants. Uh, that's that's just a fact. Most of them did come, is what it sounds like, from Houston, but from Houston before that, Mexico, other places south of the border. The one thing that I think he's, the developer said that actually was true was, by and large, the people that we talked to did appear happy. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it, was the, it was a lot better situation than they were in wherever they came from, whether that was Mexico, elsewhere in you know South America. However, there were some that were very unhappy, and we were about to talk to the Sanchez sisters. Hi guys. Hi. How are you? Hello. You are? Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen, I'm Glenn. How nice are you? Nice to meet you, Glenn. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good. This should be easy. Sit, sit, sit. Thank you. Thank you. Kaylin Swell and Sanchez are former Colony Ridge residents. Now they run a website called Terranos Houston Demanda which is highly critical of the development. So in my conversations with the developer, um, he is convinced that this is the American dream, this is an entry level, this is a service and he's doing good. That's a lie. We've been scammed. It's a nightmare. I, I would have never in my wildest dreams imagined that this is what would come out of going to Collie Ridge. What was your experience? A nightmare. Nothing that they said and promised they gave to us. I even have to put my own light pole, my own meter, and they say in their commercials, everything's included. Water, light, and storage. He would say that you're buying just raw land. And so he's not developing the land, he's just selling you the land you have to develop it yourselves. In December, the Justice Department filed suit against Colony Ridge, accusing them of luring Latino buyers into self-finance loans and setting them up for default. In the suit, the feds claim that, quote, Colony Ridge falsely represents through advertisements that lots are sold with the infrastructure to connect water, sewer, and electrical services, end quote. Basically, they do have the connections, you know, the, and it's there, but you have to get somebody to put it in for you. At least that was my experience in one of my lots. Some would say, because we've heard it from Colony Ridge, you are two disgruntled people that have your own point of view and you are the odd man out. That it's, you had an experience that is not usual. That's not what the emails say. The emails of people writing to us, not the experience. During our interview with Harris, he was adamant 
that his advertisements, which are all in Spanish, are not meant for foreigners. Outside of the United States. I'm not advertising that. outside of the United so, States. You guys are from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and they told me yesterday, they don't market to foreigners. They don't, they don't market to illegals. We do know that they do market out, outside of the United States, including Colombia because they have people from social media in Colombia. At this point, we realized in our own frustration, our investigation was a classic he said, she said. So we asked the Sanchez sisters, can you back up your claim? So if we look at their Facebook page here and you go to the about, mm -hmm. and then you go to page transparency, mm -hmm. Facebook will give you as much transparency as they can about this, um, this page. So it tells you, Primary countries and regions uh, where people manage this page include United States and Colombia. So they have people working in Colombia for them, for Facebook and part of their marketing. And Because they, they would say that this is just, so what, I hire people from around the world. We are not marketing outside of the United States. The internet has no borders. The thing is that if you get people from Colombia, the algorithm will take the ads to social, uh, social media around Colombia and surrounding countries. So I'm just gonna put place one of the videos and do, do my best to translate it. Okay. Are you tired of paying that toxic rent from that same apartment? Change your habits. And you can be a, uh, a landowner with us very easily. Have a space like this. Where you can put your trailer or build the house of your dreams. If you want your home to be in three floors, you can do that. We're here to help you so that your family can live freely here in the USA. We're in Houston, Texas, where we have land for you and all of your family. And they come guaranteed with all the services, water, light, and drainage. While we were with him, we confronted John about language on his website for the Santa Fe neighborhood of Colony Ridge. The Santa Fe says, come to America and have your home in America. But it was my understanding that you didn't advertise. Are you, are you translating that from Spanish? I'm, I, don't, yes. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen that site recently. I don't look at the website every single day. I don't look at mine every day, but I, I would, <laughs> would kind of know if I was advertising outside of the United States or I'm using that. I'm not advertising that. outside of the United so States. So why does it say that? Is that a mistake? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know um, how well your Spanish is. I'm not. I don't. I don't know. I, I, my, I don't speak Spanish, but our translator did. Do you speak Spanish? No. Oh well, yeah. Well, then what so are you even looking at? <laughs> yeah, we're both in the same boat. As the conversation wore on, we pointed out that even if most of his customers were coming from Houston, that doesn't mean they're U.S. citizens. 10% of Houston is also illegal. Yeah, and which, you know, not surprising. And that's, you know, I think that probably translates to, it wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what the rate is here, right? Because that literally, that's where they come, that's where my customers come from. At this point, we were really confused. Was Colony Ridge just a bunch of Americans living the dream, or was Harris selling land to illegal immigrants? We decided to have our translator call Colony Ridge and in Spanish, say she was undocumented. This is how that call went. Hola, muy buen día. Uh, mi nombre es Estela y me informaron que usted tenían una propiedad para, de venta, pero hay un problemita. Uh, yo no soy legal aquí en los Estados Unidos. ¿Qué necesito para eso? Mira, nosotros no checamos crédito, no vamos por medio de banco. La financiación sería directamente aquí en casa. Eh, lo único que tú pasas son los ID vigentes, que puede ser tu pasaporte, ID number, resistencia, incluso documentos de tu país de origen, siempre y cuando estén vigentes. ¿Cuánto dinero necesitaría y cuánto cuesta? Eh, mira, el enganche normalmente son mil dólares. ¿Mil dólares? Ah, sí, sí. Sí puedo ir para allá, para si, Entonces, mira. si podemos negociar, claro que sí voy para allá. Sí. 
Perfecto, entonces se va a poner como fecha tentativa el 22 de diciembre, oh, pero estaría muy encima de Navidad. Ya. Ok, muchísimas gracias. Gracias, señora Estela Pelísimo. Igual di. Ask her what just happened. So. So, um, I qualify. I don't need anything but my passport and any other type of ID. No documents. It's not necessary to have documents. It's not necessary to have anything as long as you have uh, $1,000 down. $1,000 down, foreign passport, and a, even a foreign ID. Exactly. I don't have to be legal. They said that I'm going to be closing the 22nd of December. So I'm qualified. I'm getting a land because I have my $1,000. You're a landowner. Yes, finally. What would each of you say to John, the owner? John, um, everybody makes mistakes. There's a God that's willing to forgive even the things that you've done to us. But step back. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of pain. And there's a God up there that has mercy and grace for everyone. So right off the bat, after talking to these sisters, that's immediately a claim kind of against what the developer said. They're clearly oh, marketing yeah. to people outside the country. Oh, clearly. Yeah. Clearly. And we knew that kind of gut said that mm. uh, from the get-go. But everybody was talking really about crime on the outside. And he was clear. None of that was happening. Absolutely. In the colony. None. Yeah. It was all happening in the county outside of the development. Crime has gone down. Total crime. In the last rates. two years. In the last it 10. Has. It has. N no, well, not, not true. Moments before our interview with him, Harris's team sent us crime data that showed countywide crime surging since Colony Ridge started in 2011. Well, your office well, sent me the out. statistics. And they're not good. Your crime statistics. The crime has gone down since we came here. You've only been here for two years? No, we've been here for since okay, 2011. So we let me give, it, it. But let me give you the stats has... you gave me. They okay. came from your office. 2011, murder in the county, one. 2022, 10. Robbery, five That's in 2011. True. They came from your office. Colonel McCraw from the DPS was they out They came here. from he your office. The you Senate. provided them. <laughs> I, you provided them. I didn't get I them. I didn't provide. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're looking at. Okay. Well. But I don't. I don't. You, your it, office provided them, as a good to, staff. Okay. Well, okay. go ahead. Let's hear. What, so what, murder, one to ten. Robbery, five to fourteen. Auto theft, one thirty-one to one ninety-five. I saw. Uh, I think this is Liberty it, County. Total, not my neighborhood. That's what you're talking about. That's where you get to. It's yeah, not in my neighborhood. This didn't happen here. Oh, so it didn't happen in Colony Ridge. Mm -hmm. Well, to clear things up, we had to talk to somebody who would know the truth. Liberty County Sheriff Bobby Rader. You know, and I walked in, you said, you having a, you enjoying yourself? And I, no, I'm not. <laughs> it, this is a really confusing situation that I, I, I can't make heads or tails of. It's a very different story that I get from the complex or from from uh, the developer. Yes, sir. From the people who live all around it. The people that live all around it are, in my opinion, telling you the truth on a lot of the stuff that you mentioned. He was he was adamant that no. that that everything is happening outside of the development, and that's where all the growth is. And yeah, in the development. We've had 200 alarm calls since the first of the year. We've had 46 assaults, uh, criminal mischief, criminal trespass, uh, over 80 something calls there. Uh, we have a lot of runaways out there. The kids leave and everything. We've had 105 reports of runaways, uh, thefts. Uh, the th in in the subdivision in Zone Five, we call it 179. Compared to what's the rest of the county? What's the total? Well, number? see, there, there you go. I don't. I can get the rest of the total, but you have more people in this population, so it should be more. But you're, you're clear. Stuff All the growth is of crime in the subdivision. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Good. We had a meeting with some federal agencies this morning, and they informed us that the gang problem and then the cartel problem, they go out of county, mainly to Houston, and commit their crime, then they come back into their homes in Liberty County. We talked to the uh, 
uh, sheriff's department, mm -hmm. they say now cartels, of course, are just part of living in any community. That was their answer for are there cartels there? The answer is yes. I think that's exactly right. I think it is. Um, I think there are cartels in every community, in um, every cartel community. members in every community. But if you ask the sheriff, there's never been any cartel related crime in this community ever. You say that there are cartel members living there, but they're not doing business there. That, that's so far they're not. So far. We're, we're investigating okay. and looking to see, but okay. so far we haven't made any arrests. Okay. Um, I have heard things like there's uh, drug running, there um, is a um, sex slavery kind of thing, you know, um, human trafficking, etc. Any indication of that? Yes, sir. We call it a hub. We believe it is a hub for drugs. Okay. Uh, also, you were talking about the, the human trafficking. We found several vehicles, pickup trucks, that have the back seat taken out that is an indication that, that are abandoned, that were stolen. Mm -hmm. That is an indication that it was probably used for human trafficking. You know, the developer people, says, though, so, these people are all from Houston. That's what he says. I drove around, and I don't think it looks like everybody's a bad guy there. Um, any idea of how many are illegal to legal, even? You want my idea? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Based on uh, the reports from my sergeant that works that area, their account is the majority of the people up there are illegal aliens. The majority? The majority. I was told 10% yesterday. You think that's even close? Oh, no, sir. Yeah, okay. One of the things that the developer was saying, he was very consistent. It's 35, maybe 40,000 people there. Everyone else was saying, no, it's at least 70. How do we figure out who's telling the truth? There's no count. The superintendent had probably the best formula yeah. to figure this out. And, and, and if you think about it, he would, because he would know how many of these kids are coming you know, from that community into these schools yes. monthly. So I think the only way to really get this information is to actually go and talk to the superintendent. We are at crisis level. You are at crisis level. We are at right crisis now. level. We have spent millions over the last eight years on portable classrooms uh, for the entire district, both north and south. Stephen McCandless is superintendent of Cleveland ISD, which serves Colony Ridge. The district is growing exponentially. Uh, and to, to give you an example, uh, this year on the first day of school, August 8th, we opened with 10,441 students. And as of today, we are at 12,100 students. The district's growth is entirely fueled by Colony Ridge. The we spoke to the developer and he's estimating that there's around 35,000 residents okay. that are living in Colony Ridge. Does that sound accurate? A school district has to project and plan on enrollment. And it's usually, your district enrollment is usually 10% of your total community population. That tells me we should have about 80,000 people living down there. Last November, the district's residents overwhelmingly voted down a 125 million bond proposal to fund the schools. The voters we spoke to felt like they shouldn't be obligated to pay to educate the children of illegal immigrants. I saw the schools, they're beautiful schools. How is that school gonna run without the bonds? How are the teachers gonna be hired? The school, there's still a lot, $40 million my customers paid last year. It'll be almost 50 this year. Most of that goes to the schools. In, I'm not, ta is in taxes, is that yeah, what you mean? property taxes, yeah. yeah, for right here. And so that, yeah, I think, the schools can run fine on what they have, but they need more schools. And, and I don't disagree with that at all. So we, we spoke to the developer and he estimated around, I think he said 40 to 50 million in tax revenue that he said was sufficient to continue to maintain those schools as well as the inflow of more students. His figures, he did not consult with the school district, whatever figures he has given you. I know what we need here in the school district to operate effectively and efficiently. Our tax base, our revenue tax base is extremely low. So on a $100,000 home, we get $1,000 from that one house. 
Well, typically you have a mom and a dad and maybe one or two students. But what we're finding down there is you have multiple families living in one house with four, five, six, sometimes seven children in one house. How, long, how far do your predict, uh, predictions go? It goes out to 2045. We are expected to be a 50,000 student district uh, <laughs> by the time it is all developed out. Right off the bat, you can tell that, and straight from him, that the population is rising rapidly. And he, he actually said crisis level. And they're not getting new money in. So how are they going to fix things like infrastructure for the schools, infrastructure like the roads that are this around? This is a, I mean, if there is a flood, now <laughs> we should say this, that never happens. Never. This is not a flood zone. Except we did talk to somebody who's in the process of losing her house right now because she's had to buy so much fill dirt because of flooding. Really During Harvey, in my neighborhood, nothing flooded. No homes flooded. No homes flooded. Zero homes flooded. You, so you've had no floods there? Yeah, I know. We don't build lots in the floodplain. The whole place is a floodplain, is nope. it not? No. Nope. One of the biggest divides between the developers and their critics is whether the community is likely to experience major flooding. We've been here since August. So first big rainstorm, you get the house here. Um, Water everywhere. Like where did it get to on your house? So if you walk back here, let me show you. You can, so if you see right here where the land, the uh, dirt is still muddy, I have videos and pictures to show you what it looked like. You couldn't see none of this. This was all underwater? This was all underwater. You couldn't see it. Oh my gosh. Look, there's always things that happen in neighborhoods. There's some, you know, this lot got flooded. This lot got water on it, right? We'll go fix it. There's a problem in the ditch, you know, somebody dumps a load of dirt in the ditch to drive across to put their house there or, or to start building for pouring concrete or whatever. Sure. Backs up water because they didn't clean it out. We find it. Besides we it isolated. But yeah, but isolated incidents. Isolated no, incidents. There's no, there's no flood plain and, we, and, we, and the drainage has worked well. And you were never warned about this beforehand? Never. You were on an upgraded plot of land. We were so. never told, hey, by the way, it floods. We reached out to Colony Ridge about Yolanda's story. They sent us documents signed by her, acknowledging that the developers are not responsible for drainage issues. I don't want to get... Oh, it's okay, it's okay. The mud drags in, so come on in. As you can see, the ground is shifting so bad that it's causing crack damages in our home. Yolanda claims the cost of repairing her property, along with hidden move-in fees, has been financially ruinous. We didn't pay the land for, I want to say, about three or four months because we've been having to do repair to the land. Like you under, got to understand, each truckload that they bring you is $435. Each truckload doesn't even fill half. It fills maybe one fifth of the land. So are the developers now hassling you about the property? So I got a call from Colony Ridge um, last week and she's like, um, you have till January the 2nd to pay what you owe or else you're going into foreclosure. This has the most foreclosures in the county, 95% of all foreclosures. most of the sales in the county, too. That's well, the, okay, that's, well I mean, then, easy, let me just say simple, this. Like, no 3,100 people were foreclosed on last year, in the last 12 months, <laughs> 3,100. That's a lot. That is a lot, but that's less than 12% of our loans, right? So it's a, it's a small amount for a lot of loans. What do they do? They turn around, they foreclose, and they come right back and they sell the property for the same thing or higher. Yeah, this is how this man's making money. When you foreclose on them, then you resell the property? Right. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, but that isn't, so I lose money on a foreclosure every single time. The foreclosures are shockingly common. In their lawsuit against Colony Ridge, federal prosecutors allege that at least 30% of all lots foreclose within three years of purchase. Liberty County had more foreclosures than significantly larger counties like Dallas and Bexar, home to San Antonio. And unlike what Harris said, the feds alleged that Colony Ridge resells the foreclosed properties at higher prices, essentially pocketing the improvements that they didn't pay for. So if you don't end up meeting their deadline, 
by January 2nd, was mm -hmm. it? What's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't want to think about it because, you know, I mean, what do you tell your kids? And then that guilt kicks in. Like, we were dumb for even falling into this. But, I mean, what, what do we do? 70% of the people that live out here, they don't speak English. Yeah. They don't know how to communicate. They're scared to speak for themselves because they're scared they're going to be deported or they're scared that they're going to be asked. Who wants to risk that? Who wants to risk that? He did it right. He picked the Hispanic community, the most vulnerable community. On January 2nd, Yolanda filed a lawsuit against Colony Ridge. She's still waiting to see if she'll lose her home. Glenn, absolutely gut-wrenching. Of all these stories, when you talk to the higher-ups, you never really get the human element of this. Mm -hmm. And you could see it in her face. You could see it every time you asked her, how are you going to pay this bill, this bill, this bill? Were you even informed? And I think that's what's missing, is people, who's representing the individual? We're looking at it in such a big way. This place is so massive that the only way to really understand how big it is, is to see it from the air. So we're gonna take you up on a helicopter. All right, guys, we're coming up on it right now. Yep. Which side do you guys want it on? Is that this? Oh, left side, please. Yep, that's oh this. Oh my gosh. Kind of interesting, you see on the outside, you see like these kind of nicer homes, but yeah. on the inside, the further you go in is... Look at the size of this. It's huge. I mean, it almost goes to the horizon, and that is not... We're not seeing the ends of it. That's just the develops. Develop. Yes. By the time Joe Biden's out of office, there'll be about 10 million new people in here. We don't know who they are. Uh, 10 million people coming across our border. If if you have 10 million people coming in, where are they living? You have to have things like this. You have to build whole communities. Again, the size of Miami. But look how many houses are yet to be built here. That last, last fiscal year, 2.5 million illegals crossed the border. And that, that number is just so crazy. It almost sounds abstract. You wonder where the heck did they go because of those numbers? <laughs> look right there. Yeah, I mean, and how many more of these will start popping up? And this will only be, you know, maybe at the end, quarter of a million. Yeah. Where are the rest? Right. Look at how far this goes. So in 2018, Ted Cruz won by just over 200,000 votes. Already, this is almost half of that. In 10 years, it'll be much more than that and Texas will be lost. Since the 2000 election, the state of Texas has increasingly trended Democrat. That's driven mostly by shifts in the cities and major suburban areas. In other words, the places with the most growth. It's interesting because you get, you get out of it and you see middle class America, but it's nice. You know, it's, it's, it's not Haiti. Look at this, this is Haiti. And the way things are going now, you kind of wonder, is this the future for America? Because this is the path we're on as an entire country. In the 2020 election, 24,000 people voted in Liberty County, Texas, overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. Those voters are now outnumbered by the illegal immigrants who live in Colony Ridge. We're told today they can't vote. Time will tell. If you sell it all out, how many houses? How many people? So, <clears throat> a lot of people buy multiple lots. So, we'll never have a house on every single lot. Um, but yeah, it will be, it could be as much as 150,000 people, maybe even more than that. In 33,000 acres? Sure, yeah. yeah. It's, I, mean, I look, thought it would be a lot more than that. It may be. It may be. I haven't done that math. If you accept Harris's low estimate, that's still twice the size of Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
It means the Trump-loving rural Texans who lived in Liberty County before Colony Ridge existed now find themselves pretty irrelevant. So you've lived here how long? I'll be 76 next month and I was raised right here. House yeah, the is house is for sale, yes. Yeah. We've had it. In his interview, Harris suggested his critics are motivated by racism. It's nicer in my neighborhood than, than the surrounding area. Sure. And so, I know that's, like, that's where the complaints come from, but it's not because of the homes. It's because of the skin color of the people that are there. So if you complain about it, you're a racist? No, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but for some people, that's the only thing I can come up with, right? The Enlows cited crime, traffic, noise, and the decline of their rural way of life as their reasons for leaving. How far away are the houses from here? Um, and do you have houses behind you or trailers tra behind you? Both, both. mostly trailers. Yeah, mostly it's trailers. the largest trailer park in the world. I know. So tell me what you experience at night. Um, it's a little better since the police is, is down here better, but it's nothing for the little road that we're fixing to go down. That starts there, gunfire shooting up there, just pow, 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 come, coming in front of my house. The music will Loud drive music. you nuts. Does it bother you at all, just culturally mm -hmm. in America, to have 150,000 people that are speaking another language. That's not, it's not like just because their skin is a different color, they don't necessarily all speak I didn't. Spanish. But you're like, only advertising in Spanish. Yeah, no, because that's the- I, I generally don't I get go you. to sure, Spanish sure. websites. That, it's just a, that's just been business. But as people like the Enlows increasingly become more outnumbered in their own community, you have to ask, who's looking out for them? I've heard this a lot today. Everybody's on the take. Everybody, like the cops? You think Every, Texas no, not DPS? The no, 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 not the cops. Politicians, all on the take. That's not true. There's no, what can they do for me? Like. What? Come on. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Uh, yeah, so sure. But do I donate money to politicians? Yeah, just like Donald Trump, right? He, you're a developer. You deal with politicians. I want to see the good ones stay in the office, and I want to see the bad ones go away. Texas Governor Greg Abbott received $1.4 million in campaign contributions from John Harris's brother, Trey. What are you and your brother getting from Governor Abbott <coughs> for $1.4 million? I first, it wasn't my donation, but I, I think Governor Abbott is a, good, is a good politician, a good governor. So do I, but I don't give him $1.4 million. Well, <laughs> no, and you could probably afford to. In the summer of 2022, two planes full of Venezuelan migrants showed up at Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Within hours, the state government mobilized the National Guard to get them off the island. Meanwhile, at Colony Ridge, illegal immigrants are now building their own city deep in the heart of Texas. We reached out to Governor Abbott multiple times for comment. We called him, we emailed him, we texted him, we sent a letter in the mail, we offered to go to Austin to see him. We didn't get a response. It doesn't seem the governor was interested in explaining what, exactly, the Harris brothers got for their $1.4 million donation. This seems like Brazil, where you have the, the nice proper folks, and just outside of their wall is this and we that's not america that's not america so in america as you most likely know there's a huge shortage of affordable housing mm -hmm. we're trying to give people a chance to do that to, to own their own home and the smart ones my customers will buy an old used mobile home you see that yep i see house? It. and they're building a house they started it. yeah they're not, they buy that $6,000 mobile home. 
and they stick it on there because they have to bootstrap it because I'm the only one that will give them a loan for anything. If I'm, I'm looking at this, I think to myself, if I'm you, I think to myself, well, let me put it this way. You know the story, It's a Wonderful Life? Mm -hmm. Which character are you? are you? I am providing a place for the own. Um, Pottersville was rentals. Uh, I'm building a place for people to own something. Okay. On the surface, what John Harris is doing at Colony Ridge is entirely legal, but that doesn't make it moral, ethical, good, or even decent. But it is certainly allowed. Federal law lets foreigners buy land here. Illegal immigrants can get tax ID numbers. Developers can loan money to them. Lax zoning laws and cheap land make it easy to recreate third world style neighborhoods right here at home. Such a successful business model and popular product have no doubt that other developers will see this model and recreate it across Houston, across Texas, and across America. Our open border all but ensures it. If the government of the United States allows unrestricted numbers of people from the third world to move here, our country will end up inevitably being a lot more third world, just like Colony Ridge. If the people in power don't take action to stop it, to seal our border, places like Colony Ridge could very well end up becoming the norm for millions of us. So Joe Biden, when he's screaming about effectively Hitler, we got to keep him out of the White House, he's communicating with that prosecutor. He's communicating with his Democrat judges. He's communicating with his attorney general. He doesn't have to pick up the phone. He's telling them and the whole world, keep this man out of the Oval Office. He's Hitler. This is where freedom rings. If you believe in America, if you believe in the Constitution, the Constitution empowers us. It's a new day. America's back. America's back and America's going to get strong again. We're going to defend America and we're going to defend our interests. Liberty's Voice, Levin TV. Hello America, I'm Mark Levin and this is Levin TV. I want to delve deeply into this issue of whether you can indict a former president for actions he's alleged to have taken while he was president and while he's running again for president of the United States. We've never confronted anything like this because prosecutors have never put this country in this position before. And they're trampling all over the traditions and the precedents that we're familiar with in this country to create new law and really to destroy this republic going forward. So we're in this very difficult position. A couple of things to put this in context, and I know why you're here, because you're not going to hear this anywhere else, and that's what I try to bring to you, my knowledge, you know, what I know about what takes place. Number one, there were two memos issued by two different attorneys general of two different administrations and two different parties, and in both, may actually have been three, but at least the two I remember, uh, they said to prosecutors, do not take steps that may interfere with an election. Attorney General Mukasey was one of them. The other one may well have been the current attorney general or a prior Democrat attorney general. So they were supposed to be mindful of these sorts of things. Obviously, that has been completely trampled. That whole notion's been eviscerated. And now the door has been thrown wide open. Who cares if there's an election or not? Uh, if you want to bring charges against a candidate, bring charges. And, of course, Donald Trump is the leading candidate for the nomination at this time. And uh, this is bad news. Number two, Joe Biden's been running around the country now like a, uh, like a mental patient in an asylum in a padded room. 
screaming at the top of his lungs about uh, fascism, dictatorship, uh, suggesting that Trump is Hitler, as his campaign has encouraged and as the media have. And that's what they did to go waters we've talked about, and they did it to Nixon and Reagan, and now they're doing it to Trump. Everybody's Hitler, so nobody's Hitler. Uh, and they're accusing you of being brown shirts, that is, stormtroopers for uh, Trump if you support Trump. But they would accuse of being stormtroopers for DeSantis. It wouldn't matter because we're up against this American Marxist agenda and ideology. So that's number two. But number three, what kind of precedent would it actually be if the Constitution, according to these judges, allows a prosecutor to charge a former president, number one, for actions he took while well, president, number two, and who's running for election again, number three. And again, as I said, this has all been teed up as a result of what Merrick Garland, the Department of Justice, and this rogue prosecutor, Jack Smith, have decided to do with, I might add, the imprimatur of the district court, Judge Chunkin, an Obama appointee, and a radical leftist. Now, there's a three-judge panel from the circuit court in Washington, D.C. The panels hear the cases typically first, but not always. And it was loaded with the usual reprobates, two of whom are left-wing Democrats, one of whom was a George H.W. Bush appointee, Henderson, who's about 80 years old. Pan, P-A-N, was asking most of the questions. And as uh, Julie Kelly has written extensively, she's a radical leftist. Her husband was one of the main accusers against Brent Kavanaugh with the lies about uh, what he did in school and so forth and gang rapes and all the rest of it. He was one of the first to come forward and go to the FBI. This just shows you the extent of their radicalism and their activism. And she gets on the court in Washington, D.C., the appellate court. She's appointed by Joe Biden. She flies pretty much through the Senate with the help and support of the likes of a Lindsey Graham. And so she's sitting there this week, yesterday, grilling Trump's attorney. And she says, well, let me ask you a question. If President Trump, as president, had ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political opponent, could be indicted for that? And so, of course, to use these absur absurd examples, these absurd hypotheticals about something that will never, ever occur, is intended to lay a trap. And yet I listened to this, and I played some of it on radio last night, and I thought to myself, well, isn't she proving our point? He didn't do that. He's not charged with insurrection. He's not charged with sedition. In fact, nobody's been charged with insurrection. Indeed, Donald Trump hasn't even been charged with an act of criminal violence. He's been charged under the Klan Act, under the Enron Obstruction Act, and he's been charged with the, under a federal um, uh, contractor's law. And in terms of this Enron obstruction, the Supreme Court has taken it up. And guess who was one of the judges on another panel, two to one, Democrats, who ruled that that, that that statute can be used against the January 6th protesters, which is outrageous in my view, the same Judge Pan. Julie Kelly points out the appointment of these circuit judges to these panels to hear these cases is supposed to be sort of a lottery system. And yet Pan seems to wind up on more of these panels that directly affect January 6th and Donald Trump than any other circuit judge. Her suggestion is there's something that smells here, and there is. So Pan is a radical leftist. Her husband is a radical leftist. They are Democrat activists. And now she's a circuit court judge. And she has ruled consistently and gone out of her way to twist the law and rule consistently against the January 6th protesters. I'm not talking about the violent rioters, the protesters. And she's ruled consistently against Donald Trump on issues of privilege and other issues as she sits on these panels. And she was the, uh, the most aggressive inquisitor when it came to this issue of immunity yesterday, the other day, when she was uh, hearing the case. So you can see how this works. Chunkin was a big Obama advocate. She's the district court judge. The head of the district court, Hal, she used to work on Leahy's staff on Capitol Hill. She was appointed by Obama. 
and she ruled on motions, including denying Donald Trump attorney-client privilege and due process. Chunkin has ruled similarly and further denied Donald Trump his Sixth Amendment right, that is, effective representation to counsel because of the way she has truncated this case in five months' time before the election, which is on hold now because the Supreme Court at least is considering taking a look at it. Then you go to the circuit court, which has been populated with radicals. When Obama was president, he increased the number of circuit court judges by three. And he did that with Harry Reid when they controlled the Senate. So they added three judges, and every one of those judges was appointed by Obama at the time. So they completely skewed the D.C. Circuit Court, which is more like the old Ninth Circuit Court now. And not just Democrat appointees, radical judges. And Biden is doing the same thing. I'm sure he doesn't even know their name. His staff is pushing it because he's filled with Obama retrograde type uh, staff over there at the White House. So that's the setup. That's the setup. So the question, so that's why this is brought, that's why this is a court issue. Pan and the other Democrats moved up the oral argument date, which is so rare, unless there's really a national security or some other type of emergency, in this argument, to try and play the campaign calendar the way Chunkin has and the way Jack Smith and the Department of Justice have. They ruled up the oral argument so they could issue a quick ruling and hope that it gets to the Supreme Court as fast as possible in time to affect the outcome of the election. This is as bad as it gets. Now, Judge Henderson, again, appointed by Bush 41, she objected to the manner in which this hearing was set up, that there was a, a sprint to put it on the calendar. I mean, there's a lot of issues these judges, whether the district judges or appellate judges, are supposed to be hearing. And as I listened to what, what Pan was saying in some of the questioning of Donald Trump's lawyer, she asked this ridiculous SEAL Team 6 and assassination hypothetical. And when Trump's lawyer was trying to explain it may have a relationship to first you impeach and you don't, she said, whoa, 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 I need a yes or no answer. You don't get yes or no answers at the appellate court. You don't get yes or no answers at the Supreme Court. That's the kind of stuff you get perhaps at the district court level when you're questioning a witness or when a judge wants a specific answer to a specific issue. But when you're dealing with a first impression constitutional case that can affect the election of the president and the future of the presidency, you don't get yes or no question answers. And you don't ask complicated questions for the purpose of trying to trick, trick, in this case, the plaintiff who's, who's bringing this case or the appellant of the lower court case. But that's the way Pond plays the game. And so Trump's lawyers go in there and they say basically there's blanket immunity to an ex-president who's made, who's made decisions as president, who's being charged as a result of those decisions he made as president. And so all the media are saying this is crazy, it goes too far, uh, and media including some of the uh, conservative uh, legal analysts out there. So my question to you, does it go too far? Let's work this through as a practical matter. You're president of the United States and you have to make some decisions. Some of them are complicated and difficult. Some of them involve life or death. Some of them have to be made in seconds time. So if you're able to indict a former president, an ex-president, for actions that person took when he was president of the United States. Doesn't that create several problems on its face? Just as a practical matter. Isn't that president going to be constantly wondering if what he is doing will subject him to prosecution by an administration that comes in subsequently and is an administration of the party opposite? of a Department of Justice that's filled with radicals, of a Department of Justice that's looking for a way to punish that former president, or in this case, to prevent that former president from getting elected president. I mean, after all, they're calling him Hitler. So Joe Biden, when he's screaming about, effectively, Hitler, we got to keep him out of the White House, he's communicating with that prosecutor. He's communicating with his Democrat judges. He's communicating with his attorney general. He doesn't have to pick up the phone. He's telling them and the whole world, Keep this man out of the Oval Office. He's Hitler. 
He will destroy our country. He's dangerous. A conga line of Democrats. The two Obamas are saying it. All over the TV, they're saying it. Their media are saying it. It is your righteous duty, your patriotic duty to convict Trump and better yet, get him in prison and do it as quickly as possible before the election. That is the message, among others, that Joe Biden is sending to federal law enforcement, to the federal judiciary. Stop Hitler. He doesn't have to say it in quiet. He doesn't have to be found to have conspired. He's making it clear. He's also doing what? Taining the jury pool in every one of these cities. And we're talking about inner cities. Whether it's New York, whether it's Atlanta, whether it's Washington, D.C. He's communicating to his voters. Because these cities are overwhelmingly Democrat. Stop Trump. It's your duty. He is taining the jury pool. He's giving directions effectively to Jack Smith and to his boss, Merrick Garland. He's communicating effectively with trial judges and appellate judges and Democrats on the Supreme Court. Stop Hitler. Our democracy is at stake. So you're a sitting president of the United States and you have to make decisions, hard decisions. In 2020, hindsight, a subsequent administration of the party opposite gets in and they look at this. And by the way, why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they look at all the decisions the prior president made to determine if they can fit it into some criminal prosecution? Even if it doesn't fit neatly into a statute, we'll dust off the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. We'll dust off the Enron Obstruction Act that has no application. We'll dust off the Federal Contractor Act that has nothing to do with January 6th. And we will camouflage it all as January 6th, as a call to obstruct Congress, as, as a call for violence, none of which Donald Trump has been charged with. None of it. Not a single person has been charged with insurrection. I'm just making the point. And then you get a judge on the circuit panel who is a hack, a hack by every measure. What if Donald Trump or any president had ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate their opponents? I have a better one. What if a president ordered the killing of an American citizen overseas? Or ordered the killing of what he believed to be terrorists, but also winds up killing, let's say, an American citizen who's 16 years old, a teenager, perhaps the son of one of these terrorists who hasn't actually committed a terrorist act? Is that criminal? Is that criminal, guys? Well, that's what Obama did. In fact, Obama had a list of targets he wanted to take out on his desk. So my question to you is, should Obama have been prosecuted for knowing that he could possibly kill an innocent American citizen while trying to take out his father? That case was actually brought in federal court by the American Civil Liberties Union, a.k.a. the American Criminal Liberties Union, the ACLU. And it was brought against Obama brought against the Obama administration in federal court. You ever heard of this? What happened? What happened? Well, eventually was decided, and you know what the court decided? Well, there's no standing. The court didn't want to decide the issue. It sidestepped it. It sidestepped it, and that's what they do for Obama and Biden and their ilk. Barack Obama, by his order, killed an American citizen overseas who was guilty of nothing. Well, collateral damage. Okay, collateral damage. Theoretically, he could be charged for that, couldn't he? And by the way, there's many examples of this sort of thing. Can Joe Biden be charged for maladministration or any other activities when he was president, criminally, for stealing taxpayer money and diverting it from its true purpose and giving half a trillion dollars in violation of Article I and a Supreme Court decision telling him he couldn't to defer or actually to eliminate the owing, the, the, the loans and the, and the obligations owed by these students. What about that? Can, Don, can uh, Joe Biden be sued for violating our immigration laws 
by people who literally lost family members as a result of that decision. People being killed on the border, people being raped on the border, illegal aliens in the country, killing American citizens. Can he be sued for that? It's worth a shot. This opens up a uh, Pandora's box, does it not? Because they want to get Trump. These cases against Trump are bogus, all of them. Look at the documents case, the Espionage Act. We all know Hillary Clinton, if Donald Trump's guilty, should be serving life in prison. Nobody mishandled intentionally classified information or just government information more than Hillary Clinton by the thousands. Nope. How about Bill Clinton keeping tape interviewed in his sock drawer about matters that were classified? No big deal. Rules a federal district judge in Washington appointed by Obama. Oh, okay. Joe Biden, as vice president, takes home classified information. And as senator, literally steals information out of the Senate skiff. Obviously put it in his clothing or in his notebook or something. He took it home and never returned it. Oh, that's, look, that's Joe, you know, lunch bucket Joe, Scranton Joe, whatever. Nothing. And so for the first time in American history, they use the Espionage Act against a former president. Rather than pick up the phone, as my attorney general would have, and said, uh, Mr. President, then ex-President Trump, either you turn over this information, or I have these chihuahuas biting at my heels, and I'm going to have to unleash them. So just give us the stuff. Even some field FBI agents told, told the rogue prosecutor, Jack Smith, and his henchmen, don't do this with the SWAT teams, and we can avoid this, but they said, no, we're going to do it anyway. SWAT teams against the former president, indictments under the Espionage Act against the former president, the use of the Klan Act, the, the Enron Act, the Federal Contractor Act against the former president. And now we come to this point, this phony January 6th case. We come to this point of whether or not now we are going to change Decades, half a century worth of decisions by the Office of Legal Counsel. That is the constitutional brain trust in our government. It's at the Department of Justice. And turn it all upside down for Biden, the Democrats, and against Trump and the Republicans. Just to give you a sense of this, Anton Scalia used to head that division. And under Nixon, uh, William Rehnquist used to head that division. So these are the smartest of the smartest who are headed that division. Now, I have in front of me the October 16, 2000 Memorandum Opinion of the Attorney General, a sitting president's immunability to indictment in criminal prosecution. Now, this is very important. I've talked about this in the past. I've used it in the past here on Fox, on radio, in the driveway, yelling at my neighbors. It was written by Assistant Attorney General, Office of Legal Counsel, Randolph Moss who wrote it in 2000. And in 2000, the President of the United States was Bill Clinton. But a similar memo was written in 1973 in the Nixon administration. And so this is a memorandum of opinion for the Attorney General from the official Office of Legal Counsel. This is an official government position. And it's, it's not long. It's about 35 pages or so. But it is compelling as hell. And this has been the Bible, pretty much, for U.S. attorneys in every corner of our country. And these new special prosecutor types, special counsel types, have adhered to it except this one. For the first time in half a century, for the first time in American history, we have a prosecutor who has not adhered to this. Now, what do I mean? This document speaks to a sitting president. What are the rules with respect to the sitting president? And they have to draw the intentions of our framers since they don't specifically say you don't indict a sitting president. But they do specifically say the way to deal with a president who commits high crimes and misdemeanors, among other things, is through impeachment. That is, you can impeach him and remove him from office. This is what President Trump's lawyer was trying to tell this Judge Pan in the panel while he was constantly interrupted with preposterous hysterical hypotheticals. He said, look, 
If you impeach a president, convict the president, remove the president from office, which means he can never run for president again, and the constitutional political process has run its course, then yes, you can indict the sitting president if what he has done is related to some criminal act. Not just, we don't like him, we don't trust him, you know, the phone call to Ukraine, no. Then and only then can you indict the former president. But that's to be distinguished from a president of the United States who was impeached, but found not guilty by the Senate. Now he's a former president seeking re-election, if you will, to the presidency, and now you indict him. He said, no. Why? Because of what I've been arguing. Because you're placing a burden on a president that is subjective, that can be looked at in hindsight, that can be used for political purposes by a subsequent administration. And we know that prosecutors, many are highly political, as former Governor Bob McDonald about Jack Smith, among others. 